Good evening and welcome to Bible study. It's so good to be back. We had a lovely break of a fortnight and we're back rearing to go. And we started on Sunday at our church. You may have watched it online and we were looking... are able to come against the enemy, to withstand him, the Bible says. The Bible says standing and coming against him steadfast in the faith. But to be able to have that steadfastness of faith, we need to uh, have a knowledge of where we stand, and that comes from the Word of God. Let's pray. We need the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God is the means of our inspiration and our instruction, our illumination, if you like. And we want the Holy Spirit to move in our lives and in our midst today. Father, there is just such a vastness in your kingdom, in your word, in your will, in the revelation that you have given us. And I pray in the name of Jesus that all that are watching tonight will be blessed and challenged and given great uh, confidence to stand against the wiles of the devil and not in any way, shape or form become victims. Oh, Father, I thank you for the victory that's in Christ. And Lord, we just ask you to bless this Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. We took on Sunday the context of Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. We're going to broaden that to Luke's Gospel, chapter 8. Same situation, but a little different insight into the man of Gadara. If you were with us on Sunday, you'll remember that we were looking at the uh, scripture that um, Jesus, weary from preaching, got into the boat and said to the disciples, go to the other side. And then he went down into the, I think the uh, translation I've got here says the hinder part of the uh, boat at the stern. And there he lay down and went into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, a storm rose up on the Sea of Galilee. And that can happen uh, almost instantly. And it threatened this sort of low-lying boat. Now, the fisher boats that you see in, uh, in Israel today are not like the uh, fishermen's boats that we have here today, the trawlers. They're not high out of the water because the uh, fishermen uh, in Israel in ancient days, and even now, they will cast a net over the side. And then the fish will come into the net, hopefully, and they will haul the net in. And because the boat is just above the uh, level of the sea, they're able to hoist it in and then make for home. Now, the problem is if you've got a big storm and you've got a number of men on board, uh, you could be in jeopardy. And they were. The wind was raging and the waves were coming up. And here these many of them, fishermen, all of a sudden they're petrified. And they believe that they're going to drown. They're going to perish. And so what they do is they go to Jesus and they say to him, Master, wake! Don't you care that we're about to perish? You're asleep. And so he got up without any affectation and he did something very, very strange. He spoke to the wind and he spoke to the waves. Peace, be still. And there was a great calm. That really challenged the disciples. And they said, what manner of man is this that he commands even the elements? And they are subject to him. So they saw insight into Jesus that he was the master of the sea, the master of creation. Now, 
Jesus wasn't finished with them. He says to them, why, why couldn't you do that? Why were you so fearful? Are you still afraid? And of course they had to admit they were. And the point that we're making and the point that the scriptures are making is if Jesus said you're going to the other side, you can absolutely have confidence that's where you're going. But you see, they were so easily, and aren't we all, so easily captivated and controlled by their circumstance. And what Jesus had said was very secondary to what they felt they were experiencing. They felt their lives were in jeopardy. They thought to themselves, oh, what are we going to do? Oh, Jesus, Jesus, wake up and help us. So much of our praying is panic praying. It's not rooted in confidence. It's not rooted in a knowledge of the will of God by the word of God. So we sort of go from crisis to crisis. God wants us to mature beyond that to know the Word of God, to feed on the Word of God, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now that scripture is found in the sixth chapter of, of Ephesians where Paul's teaching on this very subject that we're going to unfold tonight, confronting evil power. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And one uh, doesn't wonder, we're pretty convinced, and Bible expositors are, that the very fact that there was such a storm was to try, a storm whipped up by the enemy, I might say, but they wanted to annihilate. The enemy and his demonic hordes wanted to destroy Jesus. I think that the disciples were very secondary but they wanted to destroy Jesus. Why? Because he had a mission. The men on the boat didn't know anything about it. They thought it was just a, a happenstance when they arrived. And the Bible says that when they did arrive on the shores of the town of Gadara, a man came towards Jesus. That's interesting, isn't it? That's what the Bible says, that this man came towards Jesus. He went forth to the land, chapter 8 of Luke's Gospel, verse 26, 27. And when he went forth to land, they met him out of the city, a certain man, which had devils a long time. Now, would you notice something subtle there, he didn't come to confront the disciples. They would have their day when they were filled with the Holy Ghost after Pentecost and Jesus had ascended. But this demon-possessed man, the man of Gadara, came to Jesus to confront him. And there's a very, very real reason why. You see, Gadara was one of the region's ten cities. The Decapolis, where Jesus went and preached, and they were predominantly not Jews, but Gentiles. And they had their temples. And where in Jerusalem, lambs and bullocks, exactly that, and goats were offered as temple worship, the uh, heathen offered pigs. And that's why there were pigs in this region and great herds of them because they were offered in those temples. Now, the word Gadara or the Gadareans is, means a place bound and walled. And Jesus was seeking to break down those walls, break down those barriers and set the captives free according to Isaiah 61. So when he gets there, this man comes forth and meets him, confronts him. It's a uh, confrontation similar to Goliath and David. Only David's greater son has no fear whatsoever. Oh, well, David didn't have any either, did he? 
And uh, as he came, uh, he came naked. Now, I have noticed, not only in my ministry of talking to people that have got problems with uh, demonic things uh, and demonic uh, activities, but there are some very telltale signs. A number of years ago, just about three years ago, I visited a house not far from where I'm talking to you from tonight. And uh, there was a young boy, a lovely, young, handsome, young indigenous boy. And somehow, some way, he had been affected and afflicted with demonic power. And uh, the parents were out of their mind with fear and upset. And they're a beautiful family. And they asked me to come. And I said to them, well, I think we need to just talk. I want to ask you, before I pray, because he was out in another part of the house, I said, before we pray, I want to ask you something. Does he do certain things? He may not do all of them, but does he do certain things that shows that there's something radically wrong? Now, the man of Gadara, he threw off all restraint, and that included clothing, it included, it included uh, uh, chains. He had supernatural strength. He lived among the tombs. He could not stay in a home, a normal home. He had to be out and about and living and eating and sleeping in the tombs, a preoccupation with death. Now, the Bible says that the thief, that's Satan, comes and he has a threefold thrust in his attack on human beings to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's what the Bible says. And of course, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life. Now, just look at some of the things that this man was not guilty of, but was controlled by. Number one, he was naked, immodest. Second, he had a preoccupation with death. He was restless. He couldn't abide. He couldn't stay at home. He had to be on the go all the time. He had supernatural powers. And the Bible tells us in the eighth chapter of uh, Luke's gospel that he would constantly cut himself, self-harm. And I have noticed on numerous occasions that when people are demonically oppressed, they are scatty, they can't rest, they've got no peace whatsoever. They are indeed very much restless and have to go. And this young boy that I was talking to you about before, he had to go out all the time, out, out, couldn't stay home couldn't stay in the house, couldn't sit down too often and watch television with the rest of the family. The boys in the family would be sitting there enjoying the TV and he had to be outside. He had to go for a walk. He had to go somewhere. Restless, restless. He was always talking about death. And of course, there was self-harm. And the lacerations of the body are really the overtures to suicide. And that's the ultimate destruction. And uh, Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And so uh, many people who are demonically oppressed and goaded, controlled by demonic powers, are uh, people that are just absolutely torn apart on the inside. However, uh, there's another factor here that's very interesting. The demons within this, uh, this man from Gadara recognize the lordship of Jesus Christ. When he saw Jesus, verse 28, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice he said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Most High, I beseech thee, torment me not. Now, the Bible tells us very plain that there is a, a, a death, uh, an eternal death for the devil and his angels, and that will be torment 
forever and ever. Read that in the book of the Revelation. And you'll find that Satan was cast into this fiery lake of fire with his demon princes, and there they suffered the agonies of hell. Hell wasn't designed for you or me or any one of humanity, but rather it's the judgment of the devil and his angels. And the Bible tells us that they are aware that their days are numbered. We read about that. Also in Revelation chapter 12, the devil knows he has but a short time and has come down with great wrath, wanting to stir things up, wanting to attack the church, believers, everything that's good and wholesome and righteous and true. Yes, he's on the move. And he's affecting governments, he's affecting philosophies, he's, he's uh, affecting people, families, breaking up families, breaking up marriages, causing people to have all kinds of torment. <coughs> Excuse me. And so he uh, comes to Jesus, he falls at his feet. There is acknowledgement that Jesus is the Son of God Most High. But he says, please, I beseech thee, torment me not. Now, for Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of that man, chapter 8, verse 29, for oft times it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and fetters, and he just broke those bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many devils had entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. What's the deep? The abyss. The dark abyss where Satan will be bound for 1,000 years. And then... The Bible tells us there was a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And we know that they were being cultivated, these swine, they were being cultivated to be offered as sacrifices in the heathen altars. And so all of a sudden, um, the demon says, well, you know, let us go inside of, and inhabit. If you're going to drive us out of this man, we need to inhabit something so we can express ourselves. And so we uh, hope that you will uh, let us uh, infill the swine. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Mm. Now when we go to Israel in March, we will go near and see Gadara. We won't stop there because not only is it a part of Israel now, but also part of Jordan, and it's quite a vast city. It had a number of very, very palatial homes. It was a wealthy city. It was uh, amazing. It had a Roman uh, uh, amphitheater. It also had, uh, as I said before, a whole lot of heathen temples. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about what happened to this man when he was delivered. It's really quite amazing. Now, we know that the people that were in the town hated the fact that they had lost their swine. Now, it wasn't because there was so much finance attached to them. It was they had nothing to offer the gods with their sacrifices. And so the multitude of the country of the Gadareans, verse 37, besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship. He did leave. 
and return back again. But something beautiful happens here. Verse 38. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him, begged him, that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, No, you can't follow me. You can't go where I'm going. Return to your own house and show how great things God has done unto you. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were waiting for him. There'd been a change. And first they wanted him to depart. And then when they saw what God, through the Lord Jesus, the anointed spirit on Jesus, had delivered this man, they welcomed him. Now, you would know, of course, that throughout Israel and, of course, the Middle East at large, there are numerous digs. That is, there are places where uh, archaeologists are going in and uh, uncovering whole cities and towns and houses and, and all kinds of things and pavements, uh, tiled pavements from the Roman era. Do you know what? It was very, very, very baffling to some that when they went into Gadara, they found not just the remnant of the heathen temples, and there were many, but they found little churches. They found that there were signs, the ancient signs of Christianity, the fish, and other signs too in buildings. And it dawned on the archaeologists that this man who was told, return to your own house, show how great things God has done for you. He did that, and there was a tremendous move towards Jesus by these Gentile, formerly heathen people. And after Pentecost, they gathered and they had wonderful fellowship, and the Bible tells us that uh, uh, the gospel was to be preached in all the nations, all the world, and it was in Gadara. And if you were able to get there today, and it's not that difficult if you're uh, free to do so, you could see these little places, little churches, all around the region of Gadara. So this man who had been delivered became a, an evangelist. He became a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfilled the will of Jesus. And of course, people then began to have their hearts changed and they began to look to Jesus in a new way. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. Now let's just retrace our steps Jesus says, let us go to the other side. He had an agenda. He had a vision. He had a plan. It was to see this man and to see him delivered. The storm was to him of no consequence. We learn from this that if you and I are totally absorbed in the word of God, we know who we are in Christ we know that Christ is within us. We have an absolute confidence in him that when he speaks, irrespective of circumstances, we know that we are safe in him and that whatever he decrees, whatever he wills, whatever he says will come to pass. And we don't have to be like the disciples in that state of frenzy because the circumstances rose up and made uh, them just absolutely fearful, fearing for their own life. I mean, Jesus had said, we're going to the other side. And if Jesus says you're going to the other side, you're going to the other side. It's as simple as that. And so uh, the disciples had to learn that lesson. And of course, uh, the apostle Paul later was in many shipwrecks and uh, one, of course, in uh, Acts chapter 26, 27, on the way to Rome, is able 
to give confidence in the midst of a horrific storm. But the Lord stood by him and said, everything will be okay. Gave him wisdom. Friends, we need to be in close contact with the Lord. That's the great message that we have tonight. That whatever we face, whatever we confront, or whatever confronts us, we should be strong in the Lord and strong in the Word and strong therefore in faith so that we withstand the enemy steadfast in that faith. So it's not just a case of, of uh, chanting scriptures and hoping that the devil will get fearful and run away. Oh, he's, he's wily. He, he knows when uh, he's up against a weakened Christian. So the answer is for you not to be a weak Christian, for me not to be a weak Christian, but to feed on the Word of God until we are confident in the conflict. And though chaos rules and reigns around us, we are able to speak to the storm and to allow the will of the Lord to be done in a wonderful way. Now Jesus came into Gadara and confronted not only a man, because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but spiritual powers. And you know, the church is so weak today in the West of the world, the Western nations, because it's become so materialistic. And we're not really Bible-based. We're not really rooted in the Word of God. Um, what we are, we are sort of thinking about ourselves. And you know, many times, I wrote this today, I thought it was uh, worthy of... Uh, of, of uh, sharing with you. Many current believers have no balanced understanding of spiritual warfare. I remember a, a very prominent pastor coming to one of the churches I was pastoring. He was a guest speaker. And he spoke to me of a, a man, I have no idea uh, really uh, who he really is. I know the man, but I don't know much about him. He said, oh, he's uh, always casting out demons. Well, that can be, you know, wrong because, you know, we need discerning of spirits. We need to know what is the earthly spirit, the human spirit. We need to know what is an evil spirit. And we need to know what the Holy Spirit is doing. So uh, he said, oh, he sees demons and devils under every bed and he's always talking about deliverance. Well, I felt on reflection, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The Bible talks a lot about conflict in the spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Ephesians chapter 6, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1. The conflict that Paul had when praying for believers, he would pray and he would pray for churches and he could see what the enemy was trying to do and he had to take an authority over that in the name of Jesus, the head of the church. So all too often we are in conflict within ourselves. We're dealing with pressures within ourselves, our ups and downs, our emotion, uh, emotions and their, um, you know, varying uh, feelings that we have. And really, we need to rise above that. We need to come into order. We need to die daily to ourselves so that we are set free to serve the Lord, not only with gladness, but with great fruitfulness. We need to have face-to-face -face combat with the enemy. We need to realize that it's his victory. There will be conflict. There will be opposition. There will be oppression. There will be an attack. But let's be like the Lord Jesus, confident, strong, and walking in the Spirit. And that's why he said to the disciples, where is your faith? Why are you buckling and I guess he could say that to a lot of us, including myself. Tony, why are you buckling under when you go through a difficult time? Don't, but rather trust me and know what I want, know what I've decreed, know what I will, and then 
claim it and pursue it and don't take no from the enemy. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? The conquest over the evil one is the divine authority of the scriptures and the power of the Holy Spirit. How much do you know this book? I just love the Word of God. I've got Bibles everywhere, but of course that's no good if I don't read them. And I do read them, and I feed on them, and I wait on God, and I want you to do the same. As you can tell, my voice is uh, pretty uh, knocked about. Um, I've had this bronchial problem again. And so I'm drawing the study to a close early tonight. And I just uh, want to pray for you. I want to pray that you will be able, when you are confronted by evil and darkness, and go into the domain of the enemy. Sometimes we, we stumble into these things. Now, God knew we were on the track to go there, but we don't always. And rather than panicking, that we will be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians 6, 10. Jot it down. Put it on a card. <coughs> Put it around your house. Live by the strength that God gives you in your day-to-day -day walk. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the church. You said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it, will not prevail against it. And Father, we see so many believers getting nervous and, uh, and getting terribly uh, frightened about things and panicking and even uh, falling over and, and begging uh, uh, Jesus to, to meet their need. And Lord, you want us to stand and having done all to stand. You want us to be strong. You want us to be faithful. You want us to be in the most amazing way taught of the Lord. Lord, bless each and every one that are watching tonight. Father, bless our churches. Lord, send a real Holy Ghost uh, a revival and a revival in the Word of God so that we can take this book, the book of God, that Wesley said is your revelation to mankind, that we will comb it, that we will draw from it, that we will walk in it, that we'll be obedient to it, and we will see miracles in people's lives and our own. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, and God bless you. And I'll look forward to being with you on Sunday, and again, God willing, next Wednesday night.